Are you a leader, manager, entrepreneur, business owner, or knowledge worker? Are you leading people or wondering how to be a better leader in your own life and work? If you are, then you can be experimenting better. Welcome to The Experimental Leader, a podcast that takes a look at the ways leaders are experimenting in their own work. Hosted by Melanie Parrish, we dive into real-life conversations about how people might be using a scientist's mindset and experimenting in their work. Shift your leadership into something that works better. Join us on The Experimental Leader today. Today, I'm here with Leanne Davey, who's a New York Times bestselling author of three books, including The Good Fight, Use Productive Conflict to Get Your Team and Your Organization Back on Track, and You First, Inspire Your Team to Grow Up, Get Along, and Get Stuff Done. She's known as the Water Cooler Psychologist, and she's a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review. As the co-founder of Three Co's Inc., she advises on strategy and executive team effectiveness at companies like Amazon, Walmart, TD Bank, Google, 3M, and Sony. Leanne has a PhD in organizational psychology, and today we're going to be talking about teams and leaders, how to inspire, and also how to grapple with uncertain times with COVID-19. Leanne, I'm so excited to have you on my show today. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, thanks, Melody. I'm really thrilled to be here. Well, I am really curious. I want you to tell me a little more about what kind of work, business you have, like all the things that you're doing. Yeah. So about five years ago now, my husband and I founded our company, Three Co's, and we had the mission before we had the name. So we knew we wanted to transform how people communicate, how they connect, and how they contribute so that they could achieve amazing things together. We're really a company focused on improving the way we collaborate and co-create. And so we had that mission statement and we were trying to come up with a name. And it was very funny. We were sitting in Montreal at my in-law's kitchen table and, you know, Googling for what URLs were available and coming up with name ideas. And we were really struggling. And at some point I got frustrated and I just said, you know, I just want something that plays off of the fact that it's these three co's that communicate, connect, and contribute. And my husband just looked at me and said, how about three co's? Okay, that's a good idea. (laughs) So for about five years now, he and I have been working with organizations to improve, uh, primarily looking at executive team effectiveness and making sure that executives are getting the right strategy for their organizations, creating the right dynamics in the executive team, building out the leadership, both culture and capacity that they need to execute on their strategy. So we're having great fun. And he and I are um, a really good combo. We met 25 years ago on the first day of graduate school. So we're both psychologists. He's a neuropsychologist. So he works with members of the team to really optimize their performance, looking at decision-making and cognitive styles. And I am an organizational psychologist, and I really love the group dynamics and the interactions. And so that's our joy in the world is to help people achieve amazing things together. It's so interesting. And you have you have some books out. Tell me a little bit about those. <laughs> so uh, my first book was published many years ago now, I think 13 years ago now, crazy, with a couple of co-authors, David Weiss and Vince Molinaro. And we were looking at building a reference manual for people who had to build out the leadership capacity of their organization. So that was my first book. But since then, I've done a couple of books on my own that have a slightly different feel, more self-help for business kind of thing. So the first one I wrote on my own is called You First, Inspire Your Team to Grow Up, Get Along, and Get Stuff Done. And it really looks at if you're a member of a team that isn't what you wish it were, how do you change your team for the better, even if you have no one else to help you? So that was You First. And uh, it did really well and became a bestseller. And one of the chapters in You First was called Embrace Productive Conflict. And it was about the importance of conflict to having healthy teams. And over the time when I was rolling out You First, giving keynote speeches, doing all sorts of work with it, uh, it became very clear that people wanted more content and more help with this notion that conflict could be a good thing. And so my most recent book is called The Good Fight, 
use productive conflict to get your team and your organization back on track. And it goes deep into the importance of conflict and how to think about conflict as something that can make us more productive and improve trust on our teams and make us less stressed out as opposed to most of us who think about conflict as the opposite. So it's been great fun for the past year or so, uh, really getting to uh, speak and build programs and help people have an entirely new relationship with conflict. I, I think it's so interesting to hear how you responded to the marketplace. So you put out something and then one chapter got a little more attention than the others. And that's the one you elevated for the next book. I think that's a really interesting way to amplify the message that you get traction with in the marketplace. Yeah, it's interesting. So I'm one of the few keynote speakers that routinely includes a Q&A section in my speech. And, and I think when you're giving a speech to 2,000 people, it's just, it adds a little bit of vulnerability to put in a Q&A section. What if nobody asks anything? You know, nothing more humiliating as a speaker than you know, having a Q&A section and having empty microphones and, and, you know, what if my answer off the spot is not great or, you know, all those sorts of things. And for me, Q&A is how I stay connected to the real issues in any given moment in a team and in real organizations. And so every time I do a speech, I do a Q&A and I learn a little bit more about which ideas have piqued people's interest, which ideas resonate, And of course, which ones are not yet tangible enough for people to act on or or where are they left with more questions? And so the conflict space was one where I think one chapter wasn't enough to dispel very deep-seated views about conflict as being unhealthy. So yeah, I, I love to follow. And that's why I write a blog. It's why I do podcasts is because I want as much feedback and interaction as possible with the folks who I'm trying to serve to know what do you want me to think about next? Where do you want me to put my research and my attention so that I can do things that are as useful as possible? And I'm curious, one of the questions I always ask leaders is, how are you experimenting in your own work right now? I am having great fun right now. So um, I do a couple of exercises when I'm working with Uh, clients when I'm working with an executive team. And these exercises are focused on improving team effectiveness by getting teams in the first exercise focused on the unique value that each team needs to add. And what I tend to find is that most teams are wasting their time together, meeting endlessly about low value stuff. So I, I do an exercise to focus a team on unique value. And then I do a second exercise focused on improving the quality of our conflict and understanding the tensions that are supposed to exist. So I've, I've had these two exercises. I've been doing them with the top 100 leaders and companies for years now. And I've been getting questions for the last year or so saying, okay, this is great. How do we roll this out and cascade it in our organizations? And until coronavirus and weeks of isolation, I really hadn't invested the time to sit down and figure out how do we build what I'm calling e-facilitation. And I'm so excited about this idea which is how do we, uh, to somebody who's been through the program with me in person, how do we then give them an entire video-based online system with videos of me facilitating and tools and templates and all sorts of good stuff so that they can cascade this into their organization in a way that they don't need me, they don't need to spend the big bucks on consulting, and they can get this idea out to their teams And it's just a a domain I've never used before. I'm an in-person kind of gal. And to translate all of this knowledge that I've had in my head for 20 years into something that can then live on without me, it's complete experimentation. I've had a few beta testers starting to use it, but it's so invigorating to try something new and to realize how many threads I can pull. Oh, oh, now that I was just working on one this morning where there's a facilitated session where we're talking about, okay, now that you understand your unique value as a team, if you look at how you're spending your meeting time, how well do those two things match up? And the answer is almost always really badly. (laughs) And so that immediately got me on, oh, well, I have a whole bunch of materials on building more effective meetings. I could pull that into the... So it's just been 
great fun to have the dedicated time to uh, codify what's been really 20 years of doing this work into something that can then live on in a format that, that leaders can share with their teams. So it's, it's such fun experimentation. I'm really loving it. Well, and I'm hoping you'll open the kimono a little bit so to speak. And I'm an open kimono kind of gal. So you just go for it. You just, you just tell me how much you want to see and and I got you. Amazing. (laughs) I'm curious, like as you're experimenting, you know, these are uncertain times. What are some of the things you worry about as you put this together? Some you're in a new space, you're trying something that you never had time for. It's invigorating. What's scary about it? Of course, the scariest thing is that, on the one hand, that people are going to try it and it's not going to replace having me there in person. And so the people who've had me there in person, they're going to say, oh, this isn't, you know, this isn't as good. It's uh, right. That sort of thing. Of course, if we're honest, the other side is just as true, right? What if it does replace me? Right. What if I really am superfluous? <laughs> so it's as with most uh, fascinating challenges in life, it, you know, both things could be viewed as an issue. But in some ways, I'm trying to view both as an opportunity. No, it's not going to be as good as having me there in person. But this is for situations where they can't have me there in person. I, I'm only one of me. And the global kind of companies I work with, I can't be in all of you know, if I work with a hundred leaders and they each have teams of 10, I cannot be with a thousand leaders in a hundred teams. So it's not going to be the same. And, and that's okay that it's not the same. And if it replaces more of my sessions than I originally thought, well, great, because that's more time I can spend at home and inventing the next thing and figuring out what's the next problem that folks need my help to solve. So uh, I'm really trying to see it as an opportunity, but I I think if one were looking uh, through a a negative lens, it's easy to see peril on either side. I think I love what you're saying because I think so often when we step into the unknown, we have this feeling that maybe we should be a little bit scared, but it's like, I love that in this case, it's like, what if it's good? What if it's not good? You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's all the things in, yeah. and we're doing that in real time all the time. Yeah. How yeah. will you collect data on whether or not your experiments are working? We'll be back right after this message. I love talking about data collection and how your next experiment can start to create systematic change in your organization to create a framework for reliable and systematic innovation. Check out my book at book.experimentalleader.com. Take a look at this book and see how you can create sustainable innovation in your own organization. Welcome back to the show. So the good thing is with this particular um, e-facilitation, it's all in an online platform that has these amazing analytics. So I'm going to know, right? I'm going to know how many people come out of the gates hard and do the first three modules and, and module five and six never get touched, right? I'll know. How, how long do they spend on each of them? Um, I'm building it so that there are a few after each of these virtual sessions, there's a, a reflection worksheet. I'll know how many people send it in? How many people submit the assignment, right? So uh, it's really great to have these modern tools and platforms that give you real-time data and analytics about how it's working. But really what I want is to know that those hundred leaders that I have met and worked with face-to-face, I want the emails from them to say, you know, my team loved it, or I felt, you know, the material was so good that I felt really confident facilitating this with my my team or some of those qualitative things that are going to mean the, the difference for me. So I'm going to have both of those ways of, of understanding, um, is this hitting the mark? And if not, you know, how do I need to adapt it? If you were to talk about how you're, the leaders that you work with, what should they be doing right now in this crazy time? Uh, the best they can. <laughs> um, 
you know, if I were to pick one thing that I feel like leaders are terrible at in good times, and that's going to bite them in the butt even more so now, is prioritizing. Leaders suck at prioritizing, primarily because it tends to require conflict uh, and a conflict that tends to get avoided. So, you know, they have 17 strategic priorities because they couldn't have the fight about which ones were actually priorities. And so that's a, a big issue anytime it dilutes resources, it creates burnout, it tends to reduce the return on investment of any single thing because you're trying to do so many things. Now take that in a time when people are, many people are working from home. They are trying to go about their day, maybe having to share a computer or to share bandwidth. In the middle, one of my friends just posted on Facebook, she has her own company, this very innovative uh, future of libraries kind of company. And she said, I have something really important to do today. (laughs) And my kid just walked in in the middle of me working on this and said, how was I made? (laughs) And so, (laughs) great. Yeah. Can we just wait till the afternoon coffee break? And so in this world, we are, most of us, less productive and there is less time, less energy, less focus. Uh, And so if as leaders, we've been poor at prioritizing even in normal times, it is going to be even more problematic now. And, And there's a huge cost to it. First of all, if everybody's diluted trying to do everything, the most important things get neglected. And that's a huge risk right now. You want to make sure that the things that are most mission critical are happening. And there should be a lot of stuff you're just ignoring. <laughs> you know, just, you know what, we'll come back to that later. I think about it just like the way my kids are being homeschooled. We're doing language, we're doing science, and we're doing math. And you know what, you're going to get three months behind on everything else. We'll figure it out. History will still be history when we come back in September. So that kind of prioritization is so important. And if you're not doing that, you're abdicating your responsibility and you're adding to the stress and anxiety of people who feel like they're doing a terrible job not accomplishing what they need to at work and a terrible job not accomplishing what they need to for their families. And and that's cruel right now. So as a leader, if I could just pick one soapbox do a better job of prioritizing. If you are down to three priorities, great. Figure out how to make it down to two. How do you get more and more and more focus so that your team can feel a sense of accomplishment again, feel uh, the sense of calm that comes from knowing at least the most important thing is looked after? That is the gift as a leader you can give to your team right now. I think that's really lovely. I It made me think of Eliyahu Goldratt who once said, that management attention is the biggest m- bottleneck in North American business. Yeah. yeah. And I fully agree with you that prioritization doesn't get better under stress. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a speech that I've been working on for the past year that'll probably be my next book. And the speech is called Change Has Changed. And it looks at how we've all learned change management under these sort of Cotter models and these seven steps and discrete go from this step to this step. And it's so outdated because we're now living in this time of perpetual change. So the speech is really focused on how the brain uh, gets into this paralysis mode when it's in perpetual change. We're very, very well-built creatures to deal with acute stress and acute change and terrible at, at dealing with it over the long haul. So the speech is all about how we've spent so much energy focused on managing performance, but now what we need to manage is attention and anxiety and this was my speech, you know, a year ago. <laughs> and all of a sudden now I'm feeling like, wow, okay, so much, so much more true than it even was, you know, three months ago. So how are you managing attention and managing anxiety as a leader? Performance will follow. Mm, I think that's really lovely to, to think in those terms. What would you say to leaders who are coping with teams that have a lot of anxiety right now? So, you know, first of all, anxiety is managed through managing attention. So that's why I picked prioritization. So people will be getting whipped into a froth, worried about, oh, and there's this, and this, and, and, and oh my God, I have to take my, st- I haven't fed my starter dough feeder today. <laughs> like all the things that people are worried about. So 
the first thing, if your team is stressed, go back to this issue of prioritization. So I love the idea right now of having themes for the week or themes for the day. So as a leader saying, look, the one if this week could just be focused on this theme, that's the most important thing for the week. Or if you can't have a theme that will last you all week, have a theme for the day. Okay, here's my morning email or, or our quick Zoom huddle in the morning. Here's what I think you need to pay attention to for today. Here's the theme for the day. Managing that attention so that people know the one most important thing will help to manage the anxiety. So that's first. Second, managers often try and keep things level and unemotional (laughs) and logical. And I would say, if you're doing that, you're probably uh, causing the steam to be building up and, and you should probably expect some kind of venting, some kind of ugly release of pressure at some point. So instead of that, find small opportunities for people to let off the steam, be open to the emotional reaction, ask questions that allow people to share how they're experiencing things and then help them to pivot to, okay, I hear you. This is what you're experiencing. I got it. You know, where from here, how can I help? You know, what can I take off your plate? Those sorts of things. So start with the prioritization. And then rather than this, let's all have the stiff upper lip, keep calm and carry on approach where I think a lot of those stresses will be building. Instead of that, find tiny little spots throughout the day and throughout the week to have releases of that pressure uh, and places where it's safe for them to say, I feel like I'm doing a terrible job in every aspect of my life right now. And, you know, I've lost my mojo. And just the chance to hear them, let them say that, say, I get it, you know, share your own experience, all of those sorts of things so that we aren't creating this situation where the pressure is building up to the point it's going to be dangerous. I'm so fascinated by this this piece that you've articulated a couple of times, which is sort of the overlap that's happening right now between personal life and business yes. in the prioritization. So sort of, yes. and, and I'm seeing this with my clients as well. It's, it's like, so what's your goal for your team this week? And did you manage to buy ice cream yeah. for your family? <laughs> yeah. And um, And is your nine-year-old using your laptop so that you can't do your work because they didn't really have a laptop before they had to go to school? You know, there's this crossover that I'm quite fascinated by around how our prioritizations used to be sort of divided between work and home. It is really interesting how that whole false dichotomy of work-life balance we used to talk about. Haven't heard that in six weeks, right? Yeah, right. It is complete work-life integration, often like right onto the video call. <laughs> so yeah. um, you know what? I'm enjoying it. I'm loving, I'm facilitating a strategy process for a big uh, uh, global high-tech company. And so there's 20 of us in our homes, all over everywhere, all around the world. And I'm loving it. I'm loving seeing, uh, one of the things I've seen a lot, I don't know if you've seen this, but but people's partners, their kids, like delivering a cup of coffee to them while they're on a Zoom call. I I love it. I I had a coaching client who's a leader in healthcare. Yeah. You know, the the drive-through COVID test, she's in charge of, you know, making sure there's docs on that program. Wow. Like frontline, super frontline. And her son, her high school age son, walked in, sat down in front of the screen and chatted with me for a while. And I am so loving, interesting. Yeah, it, it is. I feel like this particular client I'm working with right now, the bond is going to be so much stronger. I notice myself thinking about the client more often, thinking about little extra things I could do that are useful because I feel like I know them. I'm in their houses. I know who's got knickknacks and who doesn't have knickknacks. And I know, you know, who wears a, a hoodie all day and, and who's the guy putting on the shirt and like the proper, proper dress shirt and, and why. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a psychologist. This is fun for me. And so I'm loving that we are understanding people's realities much better now, right? We're also understanding, you know, who's the person who's got the kids walking through the back of the video call, but who's the person who is single or whose kids are already grown and they're doing this alone? And where's my empathy for them and their experience? And how do I notice that 
you know what, normally they're the ones who've been taken on a lot of extra workload because they feel like their time at night, well, I got nothing else to do. Well, how do I feel about that? Is that fair? Mm. Shouldn't they be binging Netflix if they were like, I have to do <laughs> right? more workload? So I'm just thinking about people more holistically because I'm seeing them in their natural environment, in their natural habitat. Um, and I love it. And I hope that's one of the things that remains after that we're more comfortable. And the other thing is we're getting a higher and higher and higher percentage of people turning their cameras on as each week goes by, because mm-hmm. you can see it's a much better experience when you have your camera on. And so we're getting those higher fidelity interactions over virtual. So there's lots of things that I hope stay with us after, uh, as long as we can all get back to, I'm a hugger. I want to hug people. I want to travel. I want to, I want those things back but uh, there's a lot that I, I don't want to go back to how it was. I have a question for you since you mentioned that you're a psychologist. Yeah. I, I've, I've seen a few people on my journey that aren't doing so well at home. Yeah. The, you know, there, there might be a, a parent with a special needs kid or a kid who has a hard time being at home that is compromised in their work life because of that. I also have some single clients who you know, they're at home alone 24-7. Yeah. They're super driven. They were, you know, used to having full lives. And all of a sudden, you know, their mental health is suffering. What would you say to those people? I think, so, you know, I said three poses about communication, connection, and contribution. Don't forget the first two, right? I think these folks, especially these high performers, have been on contribution mode. If I can can just contribute and contribute and contribute. And, And it's how do you reach out? How do you find connection? And you might find it in places you never expected it, right? The thing that I really remember, it really harkens back for me to my first maternity leave, so 18 years ago now. And I had finally found this group of other moms who had kids all within four weeks of of my daughter. And we used to meet up once a week and, and go for lunch and take the babies for a walk and all those kinds of things. And I remember two or three days after that, I would be feeling so isolated and so alone again. And I would be crying my eyes out. And when I would see that, but I would feel like, well, we've already had our once this week and I'm sure everyone else is fine. I don't want to bother them. And, you know, at some point a few months later, I admitted that this is what had been going on. And <laughs> multiple people said, you too? <laughs> you know, I was Aww. sitting at home crying too. And so I would say if, if that's you, assume there are others in the same boat and reach out, right? Just reach out and say, and I did this with my best friend, you know, I hadn't heard from her in a while. She has a very busy job and a very busy family. And I just emailed her on the weekend. I texted her and just said, time for a tea, a tea and FaceTime this week. And, and she said, yeah, of course. Like we just, we hadn't been thinking about it. Reach out, ask for what you need, seek it out. It may be with different people than, than you thought, right? It may be somebody from work who, you know, when you see into their Zoom is in the same boat as you. And, you know, you can do something innocuous to start. Like, I'd love to follow up with you on the Acme proposal, right? Schedule a time. And, but you may find that 15 minutes on the Acme proposal turns into an hour just shooting the breeze or talking about their experience or so find ways of creating connection. And then if your mental health is suffering, invest in your mental health, right? So how do you get more fresh air? How do you get out in nature if there's a safe place for you to get out in nature at the moment? Access helplines if you need access to those sorts of supports. There are amazing resources popping up from, I know in Toronto, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health is putting out webinars and resources for people. So really don't suffer in solitude. Reach out, find uh, ways of connecting. It will make all the difference. Mm. Well, Leanne, I'm so happy to have you on the show today. Where can people find you? So the easiest place to find me is leannedavy.com, which sounds really easy, but of course, both of those names are hard to spell. So it's L-I-A-N-E-D-A-V-E-Y.com. So leannedavy.com. And, you know, that has a link directly into my email. And on the blog page there, there's about 500 articles and resources and downloadables and all sorts of things to help you with all the 
messy people stuff that gets in the way of building uh, high performance organizations. So I would love for all of your listeners to have access to those tools. Thank you so much. That's so exciting. I'll check it out as well. I'm very excited that we got a chance to chat. It was really fascinating. And thanks for being here. Oh, my huge pleasure. Thank you so much, Melanie. This is Melanie Parrish, and I love talking with Leanne Davy today about leaders in real life situations. What I'm most curious about is how leaders' home lives and business lives are crossing as we combine the work life that we have and our home life together. We have a whole new set of priorities and they're not very linear. We're used to that work-life balance and separation. And all of a sudden, prioritization has a whole new nuance to it. We have to shift in the way that we think about ourselves and our families and our work. And they've become way more integrated than we ever expected. I'm curious about how we can experiment to hold our own focus, how we can make priorities that are separate, and when we make priorities that are integrated. When my child has a need during the day, do I push my work or do I ask my child to wait? I, like others, have children who are doing school at home while I am running a business at home. How do I integrate my life into my priorities, my home life, into my work life priorities? And I think this is something that everyone is grappling with about now. These are not simple times. I do think that if we try something for today, these can be 24 to 48 hour experiments. We can try and experiment about how we prioritize. We can collect data. We can see how it worked. And then we can adjust and try another experiment in another couple of days. We don't have to find one plan that's always going to work. Something that works tomorrow may not work a week from now. So we can keep experimenting and keep trying new things rather than to force things into a very solid structure. It's a great way of being an experimental leader in our whole lives. This is Melanie Parrish. Go experiment. Thank you for joining us on another episode of The Experimental Leader. We hope you have found value in today's episode because we're dedicated to helping you become the experimental leader you want to be. To access the show notes or learn more about working with Melanie, visit melanieparish.com. Go experiment. <laughs>